Hi, everybody. It's Rob Shapiro from In the Mind Of. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to talk to Sean Altman. Sean is a PT who works out of our, one of our facilities in Frog's Neck. And just a little bit, welcome, Sean. Kind of excited to talk to you. Tell me a little bit about your background. You and I have talked a bunch, but tell everybody out there a little bit about you. So I've been in the outpatient setting for almost seven years now. Um, I've done extensive training in McKenzie approach, um, Maitland, some Syriacs, um, Mulligan, and, and a variety of other applications. Um, you know, and, and really uh, all of these experiences have, have boiled down to you know, a more concise and, and evidence-based you know, physical therapy approach. Okay, what we're going to talk about, Sean and I have been talking about a bunch of things, but directional preference is one of those things we talk about, hear about, and some of the problem I have I, when I heard about it initially and kind of learning more from you about it, but directional preference versus centralization, are they the same, different? Kind of give us a little bit about that. Sure. So, so directional preference is, the, the basic definition is the, that repeated movements result in either an improvement in symptoms or an improvement in mobility and in, in, in movement. Um, and, it, and the two are not exclusive of each other. So there could be an improvement in pain as well as movement, or the improvement could just strictly be in terms of pain. Um, centralization, you know, we're all, a lot of us are familiar with that phenomenon. Um, centralization occurs when these repeated movements cause a centralization of the symptoms. In other words, that the, the symptoms move from a distal location to a more proximal location. Uh, if it was like a sciatic, you know, symptom down the leg, that it would move up, the symptoms would move up the leg in response to the repeated movements. Um, now, and does centralization just have to do with the spine per se, or does it do with centralization? Could it be a joint or a spine is really centralization with a, with a spinal related dysfunction? So in terms of McKenzie, they really only apply the centralization concept to the spine. Um, when they treat the extremities, they use the term localization. Um, which really is 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 more of a way of just thinking of just improvement in symptoms. Um, you know, in terms of our peripheral joints, we don't typically have you know long referral patterns, so it would really be challenging to you know to discover true centralization in those areas. Um, so, would yeah. centralization be a kind of it's a directional preference. Centralization goes under the category of directional yes. preference. Does that be yes. correct? Okay. So, so yeah, centralization is a specific type of directional preference. So if you, if you demonstrate centralization, you have directional preference. If you have a directional preference, you don't necessarily demonstrate centralization. Okay. So if I had an example, let's say somebody go back and they come in with hip pain. How do I determine, is it, um, what would you say directional preference? Can you centralize with just a pain that doesn't go down the leg? Is it directional? How would you define directional preference with a hip pain per se? So if, if, the, if the symptoms were coming from the lower back and referring into the hip, um, centralization would occur if those symptoms moved from the hip to, into the lower back, you know, and, and out of the hip. So that would be, sent, uh, you know, that would, that would be centralization. Um, directional preference would be if those symptoms simply improve. So say they have symptoms that radiate, you know, from the low back down into the glute area of the hip, and they rate it at a 7 out of 10 pain scale. And then after these repeated movement exercises, that pain goes from a 7 to a 4. Um, that would be a directional preference, but it would not be centralization because the symptoms have been centralized. They haven't moved, but they have improved. Um, and the other thing that's really important to note in terms of directional preference is that motion, mobility is also a qualifier for directional preference. So a good example I like to use with mobility is say the shoulder. Um, someone could have a directional preference where they do an exercise and the result of that exercise is improved motion, improved range of motion of the shoulder, say be it flexion, abduction, internal rotation, something, you know, one of those, you know, impairments. Um, but there won't necessarily, in a lot of cases, be an improvement in pain initially. So they may still have end range pain that's identical to when you first tested them, but the range of motion is improved. Um, so that person has the directional preference, but that directional preference is qualified by the mobility improvement, not necessarily the pain improvement. Right. How would you do it? Like an example, the shoulder, since you're on that, 
how would I know what's what's a typical directional preference for a shoulder? You know, what's a, is there so a specific? The, the most common directional preference of the shoulder is extension, um, followed by extension with internal rotation. So the the behind the back at you know towel stretch. Um, those are the those are the typically the two most common patterns. Um, and what we're you know they have they have some generalized practice patterns that we learn where you know if the person is limited in overhead motion and in internal rotation there's a high likelihood that those are going to be the motions that they respond to if however they don't have a loss of internal rotation they have full ro internal rotation when they reach behind their back they can go all the way up to you know inferior angle scapular you know whatever is normal for that particular person and it's symmetrical you know left versus right um, they typically will respond to horizontal adduction, bringing the arm across the body. And that would be the other pathway for repeated movements for the shoulder. Um, okay, so we get an example. So we know a lumbar with centralization, we do lumbar flexion and we do it. So shoulder, if I do shoulder flexion, repeated it, and then that would be my test motion. I can't do it. Right. Then I would go to my extension. Yep. Where I repeat my extension, then come back to... Yep, and then you would, retest, retest. you would retest flexion in any and all, you know, uh, areas that had limitation in range of motion or produce pain, you know, because we have those shoulder patients that have full range of motion, but they have, you know, like a painful arc or, you know, a pain in a particular motion. Um, and what we would be looking for is either an improvement in the pain or an improvement in the range of motion. And either of those two would, would you know, tell us that we, there is a directional preference. So if I did an activity and then all of a sudden I tested again, it got worse, then I know that would be the, not the direction, obviously. It would right, be right. And, and like, we've, like we've learned with the spine, often the opposite motion is restorative. So if, you've, right. so if you found a motion of the shoulder that makes it worse, then typically the, the reverse of that motion will actually help. Um, you know, in, in our patients who are horizontal adduction um, responders, those are people who very often horizontal abduction creates a worsening in symptoms. Um, I remember in mm -hmm. one of our classes, you know, we had a patient who his, his shoulder symptoms were aggravated by push-ups or bench press. He was a, you know, a, a fitness, you know, guy. And that's exactly what push-ups or bench presses is that horizontal abduction. Um, and it was very interesting. We would have him do 10 push-ups. His range of motion would get significantly worse. His mobility would get, his uh, pain would get significantly worse. Then he would do 10 of the opposing motion, the horizontal adduction, his directional preference, and it would go back to normal. Um, and, and we even had a little fun with the guy and we kept on going back and forth just to show mm -hmm. that there was such a connection, a correlation between the two. And I think that's really important when we work with patients is getting them to buy in, to understand the connection between the repeated movement and the improvement in either their pain, their mobility, or both. And if they understand right. so that understand. connection, yeah. then they really are more likely to comply with the exercises to do their home program. So a little bit different. So we, we kind of say somebody is centralized. We understand the spine because we do it more and more. They're centralized. They repeatedly do it. Do it through load, 24 hours in a row. We know they're centralized. What happens with the, with a, with a, um, you know, a dir shoulder directional preference in the shoulder? Typically, yeah. How do we know if it's directionalized? Whatever the word is. So, so typically, it the pain will either will either localize, like it'll shrink, or it'll improve in terms of its severity. Um, so like a shoulder, you may have a little bit of referral pain kind of down the arm to the elbow. That, that's right. typically that referral pattern we get with the shoulder. Um, and they may say, right. well, now it's more, you know, at the top of the shoulder. So that's, that's what we would call that localization. Um, okay. You know, if, if the pain has moved from that radiating into the elbow to a more central location, probably along, you know, what would be like the supraspinatus, you know, the rotator cuff. Um, with the hip, you know, same, same thing goes. We, you know, they may have anterior hip pain that radiates into the groin and afterward it moves more to just like a pinpoint or smaller location, you know, in the front of the hip. Um, right. But as I had mentioned before, um, shrinking or localizing of the pain is not necessary to, 
have a directional preference. The only thing we need is either an improvement in the pain level or an improvement in range of motion. You know, is it the or same both. as spine? So then we have to go the other direction. Like, let's say we got, we centralized for spine, we centralized it to extension. We know we have to regain flexion at some point. Is the yes. extremities work the same way? Yep. yep, exactly. Um, the good thing about the extremities is we typically move them in, in many planes of motion. So restoring those motions is pretty quick usually. Um, but right. yes, you're absolutely right. If, if we are working on hip extension um, and they still have a little bit of a loss of hip flexion at the, you know, the conclusion of, of you know, a few sessions, then you know, as, as we've determined that that area is stable, we will go after the remaining you know, areas that are, are limited. Okay, it's interesting. So now, anything else about, so key, we're coming back and forth, but I think the interesting part, which I never understood as much and more lately, is that directional preference with, um, with spine doesn't have to do centralization. So somebody with just lateral hip pain could just say, I know you, we talked about it before, we don't like to talk about the anatomical part, but sometimes we do, we, the doctors do, so I do. So the outside of the disc could just be irritated and just by repeated motion can help it, that's a directional preference. It might not centralize per se, Right, right. And you just so the pain will get less, and right. I think that's what sometimes. And we, you gave me a number of case study we talked about. You and I talked a little bit today about a patient with hip pain. Right, you had seen somebody in a you know, for your friend. Tell me that. Tell them a little story about your friend recently, yeah, so, yesterday. Right. Yeah. So I I had a patient who had you know an MRI positive for cam impingement, FAI, um, and significant uh, anterior and superior labral tears. Um, and they responded very favorably to a hip extension based repeated motion. Um, mm -hmm. That the, the exercise not only um, decreased the pain, um, it did localize the pain because this patient had a little bit of groin pain, you know, radiating into the groin um, and it, it localized it to the, you know, the front of the hip and eventually it, it eliminated the pain. Um, and and give the story, you're talking about your friend, somebody else who had uh, eight weeks of therapy and they, right, what was that one? Remember the lumbar patient? Oh yes. So they had they had eight weeks of therapy for low back radiating into their glute discomfort, um, and they and they basically they did your typical you know core exercise regimen you know that that you know a, a general physical therapy office would put them through you know your your TA multifida QL oblique, you know, all of those training exercises. And he did it for about eight or nine weeks um, before speaking <clears> with me. Um, and there was no doubt that, you know, his, his core had strengthened from this program, uh, but he was still getting symptoms. Um, they were marginally improved. You know, he went from, say, um, a five out of 10 to six out of 10 symptoms to maybe a four, four you know, a three or a four. Um, so definitely the core was protecting his spine, um, but no interventions had been done, you know, and no repeated movements testing has had been done, you know, in terms of his lower back and his hip symptoms. Um, and we we did some press up, we did some repeated extension, um, and immediately he had an improvement in range of motion um, and a decrease in his glute pain. A little, actually, a little bit of centralization because it moved from the glute to a more central location to like a pinpoint area right around, I would say, like L5 S1 area. Um, right. So very, very important to do this testing early in the treatment, um, you right. know, rather than later on, you know, he had to wait, you know, eight to 10 weeks before, you know, coming to this conclusion. Right. I thought the cool part with this case study is that typically, you know, if, if you're not doing the McKenzie system as a consistent and trained in it, you would say, oh, it's not below the gluteal fold. It's probably repeated motion isn't involved. I don't have to do repeated testing because it's not ridiculous pain. Right. So, you know, your discussion about that, hey, this gluteal pain doesn't mean it's hitting the nerve root, but we still have pain that could be whatever driven, discogenic driven, that repeated motion gave me more directional preference. Even if it didn't centralize, it would have been yep. directional preference. So it's kind of a good to see, and it's a good way, I think, for everybody. I think, in my opinion, that people see that, understand McKenzie directional preference or centralization more when they see this big blown down to the calf. You know what I mean? They say it's in my calf and my hamstring. But when you see a case just gluteal pain without this radiating pain that goes, you know, more ridiculous, people are like, well, probably not a discogenic because it's not down the leg. Right. So I thought that was a great, great case study, you know, learning from it. 
Um, any, what are big misconceptions do you think about directional preference? So what kind of, if you have pearls, some centralization pearls or directional preference pearls that you want everybody to kind of, what I would like say, my, or biggest, my biggest pearl is to not give on up on it too quickly. Um, you know, a lot of patients um, will come in for their initial evaluation in, you know, an acute flared up state, you know, with say lower back or neck pain. Um, and initially, the repeated movements may not produce centralization or direct, show a directional preference. And that's not necessarily because this patient won't respond to that that exercise. Um, in a lot of cases, it's just because there's too much inflammation around the joint that the movement isn't going to be productive. Um, so I would encourage people to circle back to those exercises once the person's symptoms have settled down. Um, you know that the, in the acute phase, we always re recommend you know you know rest, ice, anti-inflammatories, etc. Um, settle down the symptoms. Um, and, and, you know, in, in a, the other pearl I would say is that sometimes mobility is the factor that's preventing someone from responding to these repeated exercises. So, so just because they don't respond to a repeated motion on the initial eval, they may respond to it after a couple of sessions of manual therapy, stretching, something to improve spinal or even peripheral joint mobility. Once they've gotten enough mobility out of that joint, all of a sudden those exercises may be successful. Now, during your exam, how many reps do you put somebody through? Like, there's always I've heard anything from you ten and people who thirty. I've heard fifty. What's the McKenzie or the thinking process in your experience? How many reps to test it? This is not a directional preference person. How I many, think you, how many did you give up? On you that? typically need to do at least two or three sets. Um, you know, my experience has been that. Um, in the vast majority of patients, one set of 10 is not enough. Um, what you'll typically get after one set is they'll say, it might be a little better. I, I, I can't tell. I think there might be some improvement. They can't, you know, it's not always obvious. Um, but then after doing more of them, you know, it gets better. Um, and then the mobility piece really comes into play. So I always urge people to look at mobility because often that's the first thing that will improve. Um, so a lot of patients may have a directional preference for a movement and the only thing they demonstrate after doing that movement is an improvement in mobility. They'll tell you the pain is exactly the same, but you send them home with that and then two or three days later, not only is the mobility improving, they tell me, tell me, oh, after a couple of days, the pain started to improve as well. And this improved also. Um, right. So, you know, just being aware of that definition of directional preference, that is mobility and pain guided and to keep aware of those, those areas. Good. Yeah. Some really good points. It's kind of interesting to, you know, we'll use more and more. And again, you know, in, in our, in our education department, we've started to use more algorithms. And since our talking, we're probably adding more directional preference, you know, a little bit, a little deeper into that directional preference component of it but uh that's great good stuff um what we'll do is we'll kind of if you're up for it we'll follow up with some other stuff we'll talk a little bit about more about you know different systems within the McKenzie or different um you do directional preference we could do you know talk about mobility stability kind of stuff we'll kind of get into that going forward um i appreciate it appreciate your time thank you and we'll talk more okay All this right. is uh, rob shapiro from in the mind of and with sean altman Talk to you soon. Thanks, Sean. Thank you.